the biomedical world actually has uh, missed this. And you see this right from bacteria, right up to humans and everything in between, all cell types. The ones that did develop this mechanism or they evolved these kinds of adaptations to various stressors, those are the ones that survived. Welcome to the Seam Lund podcast. I'm your host Seam Lund. Today, our guest is Dr. Edward Calabrese. He's a toxicologist and a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Edward is one of the world's leading experts in hormesis, the concept of a dose response to a toxin or stressor that yields a positive adaptation. He's published dozens of papers and articles on the topic Topic and has researched this for decades. In this episode, we're going to talk about the fundamental role of hormesis in longevity, biological resilience, aging, and what to do to become stronger and healthier as an individual. Edward, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yes, I'm also very uh, excited to have you because uh, I actually you know, wanted to do a podcast with you for several years, or at least I've known about your uh, research for several years. Uh, when I was yeah learning about the concept of hormesis multiple years ago, and then doing that process, stumbling stumbling upon these different studies and papers that uh, were like mostly written by you, <laughs> so you've been like one of the pioneers in this field of stress adaptation and uh, hormesis. So I'm yeah really excited uh, to have you on the show. No, thanks very much. I'm glad you got me before I died. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> good timing, but, right? Good timing. But uh, for the people who aren't aware of um, the idea behind hormesis, you know, we can start off with uh, what is this concept and why is it like so important uh, overall? Well, it's a, actually, it's a pretty fundamental question. What is hormesis? And and I think the audience should know that it's uh, the definition that I give is uh, hormesis by calibres. I mean, there there are different uh, uh, ways to look at this, and I'll try to explain how people uh, might see the concept of hormesis and and how it plays out. And I have a very broad conceptual perspective on it, um, and I think it it relates uh, a lot to how I how I entered this this field of biology, and it really is different than than um, most others who came on to it more recently. And, and that is that I, I, I see hormesis as a, as a, a biphasic dose-response relationship. It's a low-dose stimulation and a high-dose inhibition. However, it's not just any type of biphasic dose-response. Um, as I came to learn, uh, the hormetic stimulation and, and dose response in general has very specific uh, quantitative features to it. And something that I didn't know when I first started, and I, and I didn't know this for maybe a decade or so as I collected more and more information, and that is that I, I thought that the low-dose stimulation could be, oh, gee, uh, maybe threefold, fivefold, tenfold higher than the, con than the comparison control group. And um, and when I set up my first database on this, I allowed for about a 400% increase stimulation, actually. And But as I uh, collected uh, thousands and thousands of examples of what I thought were these hormetic biphasic dose responses, I found that, in fact, that the maximum stimulation was, in general, quite modest. Um, it really surprised me. Uh, it, it really didn't come anywhere near this fourfold or 400% increase. Uh, in fact, it was very uncommon for it to exceed twofold, and with um, the maximum mostly occurring, and this is the maximum, mostly occurring only 30 to 60% greater than the control group. And that's really a very modest um, increase. Mm. And, and this has huge, huge implications for um, for uh, all sorts of biological applications. And so I, I began to take a look at, at hormesis as a simply a biphasic dose response, ultimately having a certain quantitative features. And, uh, and, and then the, the next issue for me was, well, most people were saying, well, is, is hormesis uh, a beneficial re response? Is it always beneficial? And, and as I looked more into it, I could find Yes, most of the circumstances seem to be positive or beneficial, but I found 
different circumstances where, at least from a human perspective, that there could be a variety of these hormetic-like biphasic dose responses where that stimulation was, um, uh, you might say, um, undesirable, could be harmful, that sort of thing. And so I, and so in 2002, I wrote this paper called uh, De uh, Defining Hormesis with my colleague, Linda Baldwin. And, and in it, we um, more or less summarize some of the things that I'm talking about right now. And that is the quantitative features that hormesis could be both positive and negative, depending upon the circumstances. And um, even and, and during that time period, the, the, during the 90s, uh, I'm going to say, there was a big explosion in toxicology dealing with endocrine disruptor chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these uh, endocrine disruptor chemicals, when you looked at them, many of the studies showed these uh, uh, inverted U biphasic dose responses. And these responses were uh, fit the hormetic dose response paradigm, a uh, dose response paradigm uh, uh, extremely well. And to me, mm. those were those were examples of uh, hormetic dose responses of uh, of an undesirable uh, means. And and so and so I, I I was looking at this very broadly. People in the endocrine world did not like the fact that I described their um, dose response one of their common dose responses is a manifestation of hormesis. And in, and in fact, uh, a number of years ago, there was a um, a meeting that was held in Brussels and it was really centered around my availability. And so I went out to Brussels and there was this entire group of endocrine disruptor uh, scientists. I don't know, it looked like about 150, 200. And, and I, they, they gave me the morning more or less to tell them my hormesis ideas to them, and we uh, we we discussed, debated, and so forth for a, a, you know the rest of that day, so or nearly so. Um, but it it was really trying as as people trying to engage on low dose effects, the shape of the dose response. What does that mean? It really has. Um, I mean, we're going to talk about you know uh, things that relate to to adaptation yeah. and, and health and so forth, extending life and, and so forth. But I, I come into this from a very um, different sort of a perspective where I see hormesis in a very um, broad framework and uh, uh, where, yeah. you could, where you could have uh, a, a wide variety of things. that and, and, and the interesting thing is that the cell or the organism or the organ uh, seems to constrain there, its capacity to to uh, increase its response on some of these integrative endpoints um, to this thirty to sixty percent. This is a this is a, a real mystery uh, that that hasn't been been uh, clarified. And mm. that is in the course of evolution, uh, and, and you see this right from bacteria right up to humans and everything in between, all cell types, uh, independent of uh, you know what induces it. And it actually doesn't even make any difference what the mechanism is, that the quantitative features of this dose response are, are really the same. It's, it's like the, there was this evolutionary, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, you know, process in, in which this became uh, highly selected for and, mm. and maintained over all these, these years. It's, it's, uh, it's a fundamental aspect of life. It's right from the very beginning. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. That's a good overview and we definitely can talk about the details a bit closer. But uh, basically to give like a very simple as a description is that hormesis is this small stressor that uh, that the body is like adapts to and uh, ultimately 
has like a beneficial response whether that be you know it gets stronger it uh, strengthens its immune system uh, has like anti-inflammatory effects or some other like positive adaptation in response to the stressor and evolutionarily it's you know evolutionarily we were exposed to various like environmental stressors that triggered these adaptations and triggered these hormetic responses like from the environment whether that be cold or heat or uh, low oxygen or whatever these type of stressors and that's what you know is, is like a important aspect of survival for the organism to be able to adapt and to be able to let's say mount these positive adaptations to these uh, various in response to these uh, different kinds of uh, stressors I, I would agree wholeheartedly with what you just said except my explanation my, my my definition is actually even broader and that is that i think you'll see that these hormetic dose responses even when the organism is not stressed and that is mm. when the organism is more, even in a growth phase for example if you take a look at um, well, let's say cell proliferation, cell differentiation, um, uh, you know, crop yields, things of that nature. They they almost always follow this uh, hormetic dose response. If you stress the system, uh, it, it it surely will. And 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 in fact, in two thousand eight, when a colleague of mine, Mark Madsen, he wrote a follow up paper. <laughs> To uh, you know, Baldwin in my paper called you know, which we said was you know, defining hormesis. Mark wrote a paper that said hormesis defined, and M M Mark's focus was exactly on what how you defined it, which was really taking a look at uh, the um, uh, the adaptive response, the 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 uh, you know how you respond to stress and conforming to the the uh, the, the principles of a hormetic dose response. And I think that if you were to take a look at how probably ninety percent of the uh, the scientists who research in this area, how they would view hormesis, it's exactly how you you defined it and how you know, Mark said it in his paper. And we said that as well, except we had a, a, a broader perspective and and um, and looked at not just under stress uh, stress conditions, but under regular uh, growth and, and other types of biological conditions. But the, 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 the unusual and hard to, to understand thing is um, is that is that in these conditions, and these are conditions in which you might say they're anabolic when you you could be you know um, synthesizing protein, growing, and so forth, or catabolic, which is more defensive. Uh, you you see the same uh, type of inverted U type of uh, hormetic dose response uh, taking place. It's 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 very very general, very common. And the interesting thing is that the uh, the biomedical world actually has uh, missed this in their um in their uh, in the in the last century and any, even into today's century it's uh when i take a look at when i do papers and i've done a lot of papers for example on, on many different topics one we did 14 papers on um uh, on stem cells and hormesis right and we did a couple on uh, on uh, wound healing uh, many many even 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 the ones on on dietary supplements and so forth when you look at, at uh, and discover hormetic dose responses, they, they may be loaded with hormetic dose responses. Yet the the uh, the papers that have these, the investigators have no understanding of what hormesis is. The term never, almost never use it, and 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 kind of like we have to, I have to come in there and try to educate people uh, who are uh, who 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 observe hormesis but don't actually know the concept, the term. Or what's going on in other fields, and this is a real problem within the scientific community. That, uh, I mean, for example, the field of uh, of aging embraced hormesis uh, 25 years ago. The term, the concept, everything, and their 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 language is very much uh, uh, loaded, uh, um, saturated with with the hormesis concepts, terminology, and everything else. But you look at other other um, biological disciplines that also observe these bi biphasic dose responses they have they never read the the um, the aging literature the biogerontology literature they have no idea that the that the inverted u-shaped dose response that they see is an example of hormesis it it it, it tells me that these different uh, subdivisions of biology never know what what the other subdivisions are doing and there's very little communication between them and and that's one of the the major challenges that 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 I face 
And and in fact, every paper just about now, the last two years, three years, I've I have I've to try to overcome this. I I put a uh, about a, a half a page introduction hormesis overview so that people in wound healing, stem cells, and others can at least see you know um, this brief summary of what the concept of hormesis is that that they are reporting, but actually not knowing the name and everything else of uh, of what they are are about. But this has a huge uh, educational implications and and uh, biological implications, and it, and it really slows down the, um, uh, the the scientific progress if people don't understand the concept that they're studying and mm. how it relates to other disciplines within biology and biomedicine and, and affecting the clini- clinical clinical uh, outcomes yeah. of different studies. Yeah, so like hormesis as a phenomenon is you know, with such broad implications in medicine uh, and longevity and, you know, many other fields as a whole. And it certainly is, yeah, like, I think very underlooked, in my opinion, uh, as well. But uh, we can, we can like, take a little step back as well and talk about what are the, you know, the most, let's say, basic examples of uh, hormesis that uh, people uh, you know experience themselves like one of them i can say is like you know exercise is like a very good example of hormesis but many people don't know that it is this kind of a positive uh, stressor well you know i'd say that that uh, it's it's kind of strange but every everything that you uh, experience it's a stress in life um it will ultimately manifest itself with, within a, a hormetic context, whether it is in exercise or whether it's in psychological stress. You know, you are, you have uh, what we're doing right now. I mean, uh, my my your brain is working pretty hard, and my brain's working pretty hard, and we're stressing um, ourselves. We might not see it as such, but but yeah, that would actually be another example of a, of a hormetic type of dose response uh, when you. Uh, People, many people do um, intermittent fasting, or they have caloric restriction built into a lifestyle, and 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 that that actually in, in, involves a certain level of uh, biological stress to to different systems. Um, and whether you're re- reducing certain nutrient intakes that the cell then perceives, and then then institutes various biological adaptations, changes to that. That that's that's a uh, another example of hormesis in, in daily life, put it that way. Um, I'd say uh, many people take various types of dietary supplements. I take uh, my fair share of dietary supplements. And uh, many of these uh, have, uh, um, they, 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 they provide an oxidant uh, stress to my cells. And, and that oxidant stress will ultimately upregulate some adaptive mechanisms that I hope will be translated into into positive biological effects, you know, for me. Other things, for example, um, uh, this is, most people wouldn't recognize this, but I've looked at many different uh, um, pharmaceuticals that are out on the market that have been approved. And, and, And these are, you know, things like anxiolytic drugs or I'd say, uh, anti-seizure drugs, osteoporosis drugs, uh, drugs that can grow hair, things of that nature. You go and you look at the the preclinical studies, and those are the studies that, that are with the animal models that provide the basis for how they would ever test them in a human. And when you go back and you look at the animal studies, they there they use multiple doses and they try to figure out the optimal dose, does it work and so forth. And, and uh, in almost every case, what you find is an inverted U-shaped hormetic dose response that conforms to the to the quantitative features of, of the, the hormetic dose response. You know, for example, I also looked at about two about two hundred or so uh, um, agents that can improve uh, memory in uh, in rodent models. Okay, you go and you look at these dose responses. I mean, they follow perfectly within a hormetic dose response. It's actually pretty amazing to, to me. And then. But when, but when uh, they're ultimately tested within a clinical trial, that well, the the pharmaceutical company they choose the optimum dose or maybe two doses that they're going to look at. They never get a real dose response, 
and and I'm not sure they know what they what they they're selling to the public is a hormetically acting agent. But yes, and and it is. And, and the interesting thing with hormesis, the way I'm looking at it, and if you only can can increase the maximum by thirty to sixty percent, then you might say, well, it, well, what what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, you have a very limited, uh, very limited, uh, you know. Uh, upregulation quantification that you have, whether that's how much can you improve memory, how much can you improve lifespan, how much can you, uh, how fat, how much hair can you grow? All these, all these sorts of things, they are, they're actually going to be um, determined um, actually by the concept of hormesis. Hormesis hmm. rules our life in many ways, and hormesis will determine the extent to which we can you know, enhance our healthy lifespan. And enhance our uh, our longevity as well. How much mm. how yeah. how, how much gain do we have in our system? Yeah, you mentioned the inverse U shape association. So uh, basically, it's like in it's like like a bell curve or a mountain, and kind of that. In one end, if the stimulation or the dose of the agent or whatever stressor is small, then it doesn't have uh, this positive effect if it's too much then it also is like uh negative but yeah like you said in the 30 to 60 percent range that's where the positive uh, effects come from so it's like it's like not not uh, low not high but you know just enough kind of <laughs> yeah you are know, actually it's the, the most you at the optimum you can get about 30 to 60 percent increase but my my concerns with with hormesis are that uh the the way you get your benefit, uh, this thirty to sixty percent increase. If you take uh, too much beyond that dose that got you that, you it'll begin to uh, um, drop down. It'll begin to decrease. And if you take too much, then you could actually go into a uh, uh, a negative zone. Actually, what I call a modestly toxic zone. And and I have to tell you that I I have. Uh, I'm I'm son of a crazy exerciser. I do an awful lot of exercise, and um, and and I I would have to say that you know typically I might do an an hour hour and twenty minutes of aerobic exercise a day, something like that. But for for a while I was doing uh, far more than that. Put it that way, um, much longer for a prolonged period of time, and 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 I actually started to develop what I'd call. Uh, uh, signs of having exercised too much. I developed mm. all kinds of, I'm, I'm gonna call them the, the beginnings of, uh, of adverse effects from excessive, uh, excessive exercise. And it's also tied into how old you are. I mean, I, I, when I was younger, I, I, don't, I think that it would take much more exercise before I, 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 I left the, the positive zone. At, at my age, uh, I suspect that the, that the maximum that I can take is uh, and then duration is is even though I do a lot is is less than what it was if I was uh, 25 to 45 years of age you know something along that line there's there's some the, everything has to be adjusted to to who the individual is and and where they are what what is your optimal dose response might not be the same as my optimal dose response there's a lot of inter individual variability um, that that um, and and so one has to really um, look at this, and this is this is this plays out within um, within the uh, the pharmaceutical world, where you say, well, this this uh, uh, are, are the supplement world. This supplement of three hundred milligrams a day that everybody might take for a particular agent. Well, actually, there's going to be a lot of inter individual variability depending on our own biochemistry, and so what might be good for one person. It might uh, might not be as good for another or might be you know optimal I mean there's there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, challenges within how to tailor you know our lifestyle for you know what's the optimal level of exercise for you it's got to mm. be different than for me right. and and how do we figure that out and 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 things of that nature that's that that's a real challenge for I'm going to just say the public health community, which I and I don't think the public health community has much of an understanding of hormesis at all. Mm. I mean, I yeah, think that I agree. Their 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 uh their their view of uh, their view of uh, you know uh, optimizing health is don't smoke, 
you know, you know, don't drink to excess, you know, modestly exercise. They have they have no idea that hormesis runs their biology. They mm. have no idea that low doses of stress in many different forms optimize. They have no idea uh, that uh, that the maximum benefit you can get out of something is is modest, and that you don't need a lot of money to actually live healthy. Uh, you mm. have to you have to have knowledge to live in a healthy way, um, yeah. and that and that's and that's the value of of having. Uh, I think the understanding of these uh, basic biological concepts. Mm. Yeah, it's like I guess most people just gravitate towards one end or the other in the bell curve. Like they either are completely sedentary and living an unhealthy lifestyle with no of none of these positive stressors, or they're like really hard uh, or very hard in like these very go getters. <laughs> like they're super into these kinds of positive stressors and they're doing a lot of them and different types of them all the time so it's like yeah like the most optimal results come from in like the moderation and uh, somewhere in the middle so like you don't want to be no stress but you don't want to be under chronic stress and too high amounts of stress uh, either well you know it, it, it's interesting in, in terms of you know how this this is evolving i've i've seen um uh, uh you know in in the audience should know that Back in the um, back in the 1980s, when I kind of uh, reacquiring my interest in the concept of hormesis, there's a big a big data base out there called the Web of Science that I, I tend to use a lot, and uh, and in that database in the 1980s, the entire decade of the 1980s, hormesis was used as a term, cited as a term. And uh, about 10 to 15 times per year total, total. Uh, uh, last year in the Web of uh, Science database, it was over 20,000. And so the interest in hormesis has grown uh, phenomenally, you know, since um, I'll say since I, I my reintroduction to it in the, in the mid 1980s. You know, so it's 40 years and it's gone from you know 10 to over 20,000. And, and and even even though it's grown a lot, it's still it, you still have that frustration that that even uh, you know uh, that I mentioned before that so many areas in the biological and biomedical area sciences don't appreciate it or don't understand it or don't know it. Um, but um, but nonetheless, you know, I'd have to say that there has been uh, a, a great growth in the scientific uh, study of hormesis. I used to have problems when I was submitting papers to journals in the 1990s that they the editors wouldn't even know what the term was what it meant uh, they, they made it much more difficult to get papers accepted I'd have to have sometimes uh, four reviewers from the papers instead of uh, like a standard of two or something like that and I and I can tell today in the last 15 years or so maybe last 20 years there's been a a real um, education at the level of the uh, journal editor where they uh, they uh, they seem to understand that this is a, a a fundamental concept and and it's much more um, much more uh, um, now built into the into the uh, publication system so that mm. people can actually do something um, with that knowledge. Um, yeah. But it's, how did but, you? Go ahead. Yeah. How how did you like discover the concept in the first place? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I was actually twenty years. I was twenty years old <laughs> when it happened for me, and I was an undergraduate in a in taking a plant physiology class, and we had to do a whole lot of different experiments. Uh, some in the lab, some in a greenhouse, and and one of our studies the professor made us do was was to do a dose response relationship with a plant growth inhibitor, a synthetic inhibitor, and we were working with peppermint plants. And and I remember, um, I mean, we had so many different experiments to do. I, I couldn't even remember how that that particular one was going. And this guy comes into our classroom, and he, I remember he came in in November of 1966. Okay, and uh, when I was a junior and third year in college, and and he says he said the 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 effects of this chemical on the peppermint they're stimulating the plant, and we do this every year, and the and they're always inhibited. He said, "I don't know what's going on with your 
with your little experiment there, but but something is uh, unusual and not right. And so he said, maybe you used the wrong chemical, maybe you mislabeled something. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. If anybody's interested, come back and see me. The only person in my class who was interested enough to go back was me. And so I went back and then he forced me to do the experiment over this time. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder as I made up my solutions and everything. And and we concluded, he, he concluded that I made a dilution error when I made up my original stock solution. And I ended up giving the uh, peppermint plants about tenfold less than they should have got. I put them into a low dose zone. And mm. so he said, wow, so you're now going to have to give your plants the low dose, give them what I wanted, which was the high dose, and we'll see what happens. So when I did that, I got this low dose stimulation and a high dose inhibition. I saw exactly what he thought we would get at the high doses. And I could see again, this, this stimulation. I said, well, I guess we've answered the question. He said, no, he says, he says, now you just have one, one, one decent experiment. You're going to have to replicate that and show that you can get that result again. And then again, he made me replicate that study about almost a dozen times. And then I said, I'm done. I'm, I'm convinced that this, the, these plants, uh, act in a biphasic way. I didn't even know the term hormesis. They were going mm. up by about 60 or so percent. He said, well, I I now agree with you. He said, now what I want you to do is I want you to see if you can avoid applying the chemical to the soil because the bacteria and other things might be metabolizing it in a certain way. Do the whole study again, but this time do it in hydroponics. Do it in solution. Avoid the soil. And if you can still get the... the uh, the stimulation, then you'll be pretty much a certain a certain that it's going, it's the chemical itself rather than a metabolite from the bacteria that's present in the soil. And I did that, and I got the same low dose stimulation, high dose inhibition. I only had to replicate that about five or six times for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, ultimately, we we did publish this uh, work uh, without you. I just as I said, I didn't know the term hormesis. Published it in a British uh, plant physiology journal. And uh, I just said it was a low dose stimulation and a high dose inhibition, and that's and that was and that was first started in the ni- in 1966, 1967. Still have my my original notebook, and uh, and that's how I got started on it. And then, as it turns out, I I um, I was I the the guy worked me to death so when I when I was doing this, and I said I never want to do plant work again. So mm-hmm. I went to graduate school and became an insect. Well, I, I went to graduate school to be an insecticide toxicologist, and so and then it was uh, 1985, so almost 20 years later. I saw that there was this conference out in California going to be on this thing called radiation hormesis, and that's when mm-hmm. I first heard the term. So I looked at I looked at the brochure they had, and they talked about this biphasic dose response, and they said. You know, we know high dose of radiation can be harmful, cause cancer, and so forth. But we think low dose of radiation may actually you know, uh, reduce cancer risk, extend life, things of that nature. So I said, well, I- I'm going to call this guy up and talk to him. So I called him up because I said, biology is biology. If I saw a biphasic dose response with plants um, uh, with respect to dose, then what they're talking about with radiation, maybe this is the same biological process. I don't know. So I called the guy up and um, and I spoke with him, told him my story that I just shared with the audience here. And he invited me to go out to their conference to uh, but to focus not on radiation, but on chemical examples of this hormesis concept. And so I worked with a few graduate students. We put together a paper and and that actually. um, um, So we attended that first conference. got our paper in the proceedings. And then what happened for me was that two years, uh, uh, four years later, the conference director and uh, one of the, the co-directors, they had a big paper in science called Radiation Hormesis Point Counterpoint, and they debated it. And that re that's actually what got me restarted on this because I said, well, they still are, they're acting confused and, and we have to actually resolve this because this is an important concept. And so from then 1990 to the present time, I've just been, you know, like gung ho going crazy, uh, putting a lot of time onto, uh, onto trying to figure out 
first, if the hormesis concept was real, how general was it? What were its uh, biological features? And and then um, just getting progressively more knowledgeable, you know, and 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 learning. So the the last thirty years, uh, thirty five years now. I mean, I, I've that's I've really put a lot of time on it. But but for me, it really goes back to the mid nineteen sixties. So where I was that undergraduate, and mm. so now I'm seventy seven years old now. And so so I'd have to say that. I've been I've at least introduced to that concept 57 years ago wow. <laughs> and, yeah. and, seen, and seen a lot of uh, a lot of changes, a lot, mm. a lot, a lot of great growth, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah, like really fascinating. And uh, yeah, like by now, I think it is a very well recognized uh, concept, or at least like we know that it's real and it's been replicated, you know, in hundreds of different experiments and uh well, in different well, you, know, you know it's it's interesting that you say that because i i i had a lot of evidence for it being real and you could reproduce it and in the late 1990s i i uh, submitted uh, about six papers to the the top toxicology journal in uh, um in the united states and and each of my papers got a decent review but the editor-in-chief uh rejected my papers so mm. I, I i i was really i was concerned uh, and so what I did was I I decided that I would have a big debate with these with people. And so I, I I ran a conference here at the University of Massachusetts in in January of the year 2000, in which I I wanted to because I, I had a lot of evidence on hormesis by that point, and and I and and I felt that 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 I was getting papers rejected in in the leading journals that I that I should be getting published, and so. So I, I said, I want to debate these people. And I didn't think that anyone was had any harsh feelings towards me. I just thought that this was, they didn't understand what I was doing. So I, I got the, the editor in chief, he agreed to come out and debate. Then I got uh, a former head of the US uh, National Cancer Institute to come out and other, other leading people like that. I brought in about six of them, seven of them to debate me. About 250 people showed up and it was over three days. And, uh, and 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 the first day I was all devoted to me. I spoke for for seven hours on what I had learned about hormesis. The second, the second day, the these seven uh, speakers spoke, and and then on the third day we tried to see where we were. And, and it was interesting that uh, um, the uh, the the uh, I mean I got a lot. I thought I did a, a good job at explaining myself, but I got hit with a lot of criticisms. But one of the the biggest criticism that I got was that you didn't have a mechanism to explain um, to explain this. You could have all these studies, and all these studies could be good, and you could replicate them. But the the editor told me that unless you had a mechanism, I'm not going to publish your papers in my journal. That's it. I don't care what mm -hmm. you say. And so I, I knew at that point that that the that the the, the, the it was all going to turn on whether you could come up with uh, mechanistic explanations. And and I would have to say that that was very inspirational and educational for me because we spent most of our time finding, trying trying to come up with underlying hormetic mechanisms that could make them comparable to what is known in the world of pharmacology and high-level toxicology. And I would have to tell the audience that actually we've achieved that goal. And that mm -hmm. is that a number of years later, I published a paper that had 400 mechanisms of 400 different uh, hormetic dose responses at the level of receptor cell signaling and so forth. And 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 I have to say, when you look at all these these papers in the last 10 years or so, that that do more than more than that, that all these papers now have very strong mechanistic components. The work on hormesis is comparable to any other level in. Uh, in pharmacology and toxicology with respect to mechanistic understanding. So we've played by the games, uh, the rules that have been established by the field to try to say, yeah, hormesis is real, hormesis is reproducible, we have mechanistic understandings of it, and, and these are the mechanisms and they're reproducible. And mm. and, and and so this is this is the, um, and, and I think that's why the field has grown, is that they, that kind of, uh, even though that was a, uh, you know uh, what I call uh, tough love with that conference. I got a lot of criticism, right. but I listened. I listened to the uh, the criticisms, um, 
and try to try to answer these criticisms so that um, so that I could grow and this concept could be fairly tested. Mm. And, and and it's passed it's passed every test actually um, <laughs> as it yeah. as it's gone forward. Yeah. So what are like what's the mechanisms? We don't have to go through the entire four hundred of them, but like what is the, like a broad picture uh, overview of like why does certain stressors have these positive adaptations um, and benefits uh, like what what happens inside the body when you are let's say exercising or when you are uh, exposed to some sort of a low level biphasic toxin or uh, some other agent well i think that the, uh, the the clearest thing that's emerging today put it that way and that is that various kinds of stress um uh, can can um result in 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 um, modest elevations of what I'd say in in your cells of something called reactive oxygen species, what we call ROS, and and these are uh, agents that can stress the cell to some, and and at too high a doses they can cause they can cause all sorts of uh, toxicities, but they also can act as si signaling molecules um, as well, and these uh, the ROS. What it that what it really does is it it activates uh, uh, various pathways uh, to um, without getting into into too much detail, but it, but it it activates uh, various uh, uh, transcription factors that can uh, then mobilize and, and mobilize the synthesis of a whole amata of uh, antioxidant uh, enzymes. And within cells that can be then used to protect um, cell membranes, organelles like the mitochondria and, 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 and so forth uh, against damage. And, and in fact, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is really what, what is uh, going on with exercise and going on when, when, when you have uh, supplements that are fundamentally uh, modest uh, little oxidant stressors things of that nature. They're, they're pulsating little stresses into your biological systems. These, these uh, oxidant stresses activate um, um, cell signaling that ultimately leads to the, to the uh, synthesis of antioxidant enzymes that ultimately protect cells from damage. And, and, and that's what, what I try to do with, when, with my life. And that's why, why I exercise, why I take certain supplements, things of that nature is I'm always trying to modestly stress systems so that they can activate um, um, various types of, uh, I'm going to say, chemo-preventive uh, strategies. And, and, it's, and it's interesting. It doesn't, it's, 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 it's very interesting to me because when you look at different pathways and so forth, it, it doesn't actually make any difference what pathway gets activated, um, what receptor is 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 used or things of that nature the dose response features always come out the same this is this is really very interesting if you if you take uh, uh 20 different uh, uh supplements and you study them separately and they're all hormetic and they might even have different mechanisms their their the quantitative features of their dose responses are are essentially identical they're all conforming to this to this uh, quantitative features of this hormetic dose response. This is not really appreciated by many people, but it's what I see in, in all the work that I do. And, and, it's, uh, and, I, and I don't really see exceptions to it. This, this always uh, shocked me in the beginning. And then, and then it's, uh, um, it's exactly what seems, what seems to go on, no matter what system that you're working at, and, and whether it's stem cells, or whether it's skin cells for for wound healing, or whether it's uh, you know neuroprotective work, a lot of work has has been done on uh, like the, let's say female reproduction and the oocyte. And when you try to protect the oocyte, things of that nature, they they all respond hormetically. They all show the exact same quantitative features of the dose, and many of the same agents that are effective in one system are effective in the other. And that's because they're they're acting on really the same mechanisms. They're 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 generating mm. uh, some low level oxidant stress within systems, and mm. uh, the body's detecting that and then upregulating um, adaptive mechanisms. Yeah, is, are those uh, mechanisms like conserved 
across different species uh, through evolution or other like different mechanisms in plants versus uh, humans. I mean, I mean, like you know, the broad mechanism like the upregulation of antioxidant defense or stuff like that. Yeah, they're 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 present in everything. Uh, actually, mm. every cell, every type of living creature, in 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 our in our world where people try to study aging and things like that, they 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 studied it in on in little nematode worms. You know, this mm. uh, C. elegans worm, so far from a human, yet yet uh, the, their their strategy is so similar. Uh, yeah. and they and their and their um uh en enzymatic repair um, and defensive capacities. Their, their, their genetic analogs very much match up with ours you know, almost perfectly. And, and so uh, to, to actually have survived in this world, uh, yeah. every, <laughs> every single uh, living creature is alive today because they developed these defense mechanisms and then, and then their ancestors pretty much retained them. And, yeah. and it, you would have thought that, 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 that there would have been uh, um you know how does this progress over over the you know millions and millions of years? But when when you take a look at how bacteria respond to stress, their their dose response features. I mean, bacteria, right? And yeast, these sorts of fungi, their their the quantitative features of their dose responses are really just like our cells, just like our cells. And and so whatever the the uh, the strategy was, it's been it's been. Uh, found to be very successful and uh, and it's yeah. been uh, preserved over these uh over these eons of time that that you know and and this is interesting because you would think that the world of evolutionary biology would have picked up on the centrality of hormesis uh mm. and and, that, and that's just another discipline in biology that for the most part has uh has missed the hormesis concept and and so I, i'm kind of seeing these uh, different disciplines as playing, they're, they're going to have to play catch up. And yeah. we in this area have to actually be the uh, the guiding light and, and the, the stimulator for getting these other, other disciplines involved. Because once you start getting the power of their thinking and their technologies, they can move us much further ahead so quickly because uh, they're experts in their own zone. And, and you, you want them to start thinking of your ideas. Because your yeah. ideas will enhance them, but then when it all synergizes together, be much better for um, for human understanding. Mm. Yeah, it's you know, basically in many ways the reason why we are here is because of hormesis. <laughs> so like, or that uh, our ancestors, not only human ancestors, but you know, single cell organisms, they the ones that did uh, develop this mechanism, or the ones that did. Uh, let's say evolved these kinds of adaptations to various stressors those are one of the ones that survived and everyone else uh, pretty much didn't <laughs> survive so yeah like it's pretty much uh kind of the survival of the fittest kind of a quote that gets tossed around in uh, when we're talking about evolution and that kind of thing well yeah, i have that's say, yeah I, yeah i have to say that that that's one of the causes of how we eventually die and that is that right. our hormetic mechanisms um my the hormetic my hormetic capacity at this age is far far less than the um the capacity let's say at your age mm. and and that the one has to uh th this is this is a real component for for um i'm going to just say for geriatric medicine or medicine in general and that is um it, it's so in, it, i mean done done a lot of work with the animal model studies and things of that nature and and you can see when you're studying hormetic dose responses in young rodents um, and, and how they respond, and usually quite robustly, when you get them into uh, being what I call elderly rodents, you know, over two years of age, things of that nature, their capacity to respond, they, they're not responding nearly as well as, as in fact, the, uh, um, the, younger, uh, the younger version of themselves. And, but I've also seen there are so so some of these pathways seem to decay um, with with time, but mm. I've also seen well in studies where investigators have been able to to rejuvenate um, um, you might say decayed pathways, get them functioning again, and to um, and to breathe more life into the 
the, the I'll say the elderly mouse and rat uh, models that we that have been studied. And I've actually seen in 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 China there was a a, uh, a very uh, significant study, so several studies looking at uh, people who are over ninety years old who had had uh, um, minor strokes, and they they gave them a a a treatment. It was a hormetic treatment, and and as it turns out, those who got the treatment, those who didn't get the treatment, the ones who got the treatment, their their um, uh, their risk of getting a subsequent stroke was reduced by eighty five percent compared to those who didn't. I mean, it was wow. actually pretty, pretty, and that told me that yeah, even even when you're over ninety, uh, you still have uh, this this capacity to respond. And it's mm. it's very very impressive. Um, yeah. Along to to, uh, to me, and and also even some of these fundamental uh, concepts here, um, yeah, you know, yeah. There's an aging component, and and it just means that that uh, people who are who are older have to um, have to work uh, really with a with a good focus to make make sure that they can resist some of these uh, decrements of age to sustain their adaptive capacities. Um, and there are all the sorts of things that, that are happening. For example, you know, in, in the rodent area, if you have a very obese, uh, let's say, young mice, mice or, or rats, and you have tried to, uh, and, and they're, they're, they're more or less uh, uh, non-obese, counterparts have very strong uh, hormetic uh, capacity. The, these, these highly obese younger animals, they lose a lot of uh, hormetic adaptations. Mm. However, you you have them lose their weight, and then they actually not only do they benefit from the loss of weight, um, but they also then that's tied to developing other adaptive capacities. So there's lifestyle and there's age, and there are a lot of factors that yeah. that can that fine tune, um, and they're all they're all tied together. You know, they're they're it's interesting. They're all they're all linked together in terms of uh, uh, ultimately helping. The body to survive you know and and live a more healthy life mm. yeah like obese people or uh metabolically sick people uh do have like you know weaker immune systems they uh have other like chronic diseases as as what happens with uh aging like the older you get the weaker your immune system generally becomes and and uh, your risk of other chronic diseases also goes up and uh you know, you, you can yet tie it together with some of the decline in the, you know, antioxidant defense status and uh, just other overall health uh, markers as well. Like, you know, the glutathione level, which is the body's master antioxidant that starts to decline after like the age of 45. But if you're like following an unhealthy lifestyle, then it probably happens sooner. And if you follow a healthier lifestyle, then you can probably postpone it a bit uh, longer as well. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I I think that that most people think that they're invincible to disease un, until you get to you know an, an elderly uh, age. Uh, but but you can see just on the st statistics that there are so many things that happen adversely once you um, pass the age of sixty. You know, so many you know, increase in so many different neurological diseases or cancers or other kinds of things, and 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 there's a, uh, and, and I think once disease processes start, it's it's really hard to stop them. They're very powerful, uh, progressive conditions, and 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 what it's really led me to to think about, and that is that that people really at a much younger age need to start to. Um, um, have this hormetic lifestyle because I think that once you once you have let's say um, I, I believe based on all the research research that we've we've looked at and done that I mean you could take different diseases uh, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and others and you can probably slow down the onset and the severity uh, if you started at an earlier time period you know so that you, you you're actually uh, pushing off this harmful effect because of you're resisting it. But once the disease, if, if you haven't been practicing that hormetic lifestyle and the disease begins to show itself clinically, then you say, oh, what am I going to do? I have, I just got 
you know, told I have uh, early stage Alzheimer's or early stage Parkinson's or something like this, it's it means okay. it's already pretty far along to, to be diagnosed clinically. Mm. And so and so putting a hormetic, uh, you know, push at that point, I don't know if it can do much to be helpful. I think it could yeah. be really helpful earlier on, you know, in the uh, in the lifespan to then you know, uh, reduce the, um, uh, slow down the onset and and reduce the the severity of it. So these are really public health, uh, you know, challenges and questions that that uh, um, governments and, and universities and, 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 and other groups, you know, need to see to ultimately, you know, make people uh, aware that actually when you're over 60, your health is really going to be determined by what you did when you were 30 and 40. Um, and 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 this and it's and this is the it's a long game it's a it's a uh, it, it takes planning and education and, and 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 just when you just because you think you look in the mirror oh i'm young and i'm this and i'm that um i don't have to worry about this until uh, this is when you uh, this this is when this is when the game is going on for protecting yourself for a, a healthier uh, older age mm. yeah absolutely and then, you know it's all it's 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 a lifespan you know, hormetic strategy. Mm. And, and it really, you know, if we really, you know, and, and there's, there's examples where it really starts, hormesis starts, you know, it actually starts uh, in the womb when you are, uh, you know, embryo and fetus. And, mm. and, and then these, you know, how you're treated and so forth during this early developmental time will impact, you know, so the game begins as soon as you're conceived. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and, and in fact, I have I have seen in, in work that we've been doing on uh, on oil sites and so forth. It actually begins is right after right after fertilization. Actually, even begins before fertilization, because you're you know, it's how you how you protect the the ovum, how how it develops, um, how it resists stresses, and 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 then you can affect you know how uh, you know how this inner cell mass that'll become the embryo. Uh, grows and develops, and and they all respond to hormetic stimuli. I mean, I've seen hormesis from before the start of life to after the start of life to right near death, and hormesis is embodied in in the entire lifespan. The in, and and you can impact it. You you actually can impact um, the in, in fact, animal husbandry and other things. You can impact the quality of life by imposing hormetic. Uh, uh, treatments, you might say, to uh, unfertilized uh, eggs before they get fertilized. You, you, and, and that that can enhance the the quality of life. I mean, it starts. It, it's it's a whole cycle. It's mm. a whole cycle, and and it's 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 a, a new way of thinking about biology and health and and the environment. And it's all anything that has a dose response, and that's everything is going to have to deal with this hormesis concept. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna try to give a some sort of a statement to describe it a little bit. You can correct me if I'm wrong or uh, direct it in a better direction. But you know, since the moment you're conceived, you're dying, or you know, life is <laughs> a process of dying or getting closer to the death, and everything in life imposes a, some form of stress. Uh, every like everything in our environment imposes some form of a stress in some amounts whether that be even like you know breathing and uh, just electromagnetic fields or the earth's uh, magnetic field whatever those those are imposing some form of stress and uh, like the natural tendencies like entropy that we are heading towards death and uh, in a state of continuous like decline and uh, let's say degradation and uh, hormesis is this adaptation to these kinds of stressors to keep the organism alive so that it could you know th in some sense like i guess the main goal is to like reproduce or reproduce the genes and uh, carry on the genes so hormesis is this small stress to keep the organism alive to get it through the stress so that it would survive the stress and in a future scenario where there is less stress it could reproduce uh, again or continue reproducing and uh, it's like a signal for the body to stay alive and uh, to not die or to like slow down the process of dying and slow down the process of entropy and uh, in so doing slow down like aging uh, as well 
Well, I think that's uh, that kind of puts it together. I think that um, uh-huh. the um, uh, and, and and just the, the, the for the audience to just really appreciate and and that is as I I'm kind of emphasized repeatedly, and that is that um, the strategy that all life seems to have adopted um, is that this this maximum hormetic stimulation is modest. Uh, and it's only about 30 to 60 percent. And there's got to be a reason behind that. And we've mm-hmm. thought a lot about what those reasons could be. But uh, um, but that's what all life seems to show. It all all life shows a hormetic response. It all shows that it's that it's uh, a modest response that makes it very challenging to prove you have hormesis. Audience should know that because trying to prove a 30 to 60 percent increase. That's why my original advisor made me replicate my study so many times. Because mm-hmm. he wanted to see how, you know, how do you know it's not just by background variability and chance? How do you, how do you know that? Well, you know that by by being able to reproduce it. And then ultimately, you know that because you have uh, found the mechanism. And if you block the mechanism, you block the protection. All those things have been done and things of that nature. But, yeah, this is this is central to uh, you know, central to life, you know, all life on this planet, uh, farm life, your dogs, your cat. Uh, your your grandmother and grandfather and uh, the little the little uh, embryo that's developing and everybody in between. It's uh, this is a central feature of evolutionary biology and and um, and I, I I think that this is uh, hopefully it'll get more known as we go down the road. Yeah. So you mentioned the thirty to sixty percent uh, response. So like. So you can expect to gain thirty to sixty percent of benefits compared to the the placebo or the con- control group. That's that- it. That that's that's it. Optimal. Mm. See that that's even at optimal. A lot of times, say, if you and I were to, um, if we have a, a number of people taking the same treatment, we may find that that what's optimal for you, uh, you might get thirty to sixty percent. I might only get fifteen percent. You know, we might be we're in that kind of uh, hormetic uh inverted you but but it's really only the optimal and and how do you how do you optimize that response i mean that that takes a lot of work work to do that not only almost anybody knows you know how to optimize it for an individual this is mm-hmm. a this is really a uh you know i'm when i'm when i'm exercising to be honest with you i'm supposed to be like mr hormes is sort of a guy right mm-hmm. and my wife says to me she says how do you know what the optimal uh, duration and intensity is for your hormetic response. Uh, is that different than, than hers? Is it different than somebody else's and so forth? And I said, well, nobody actually knows that. You know, what do you know what, what's optimal for you? And, uh, and I have to say for myself, uh, because I, I take, I do so many things and I take a variety of stuff, what I think are hormetic based supplements, but I have to make sure that I'm not causing myself toxicity by doing too much. Mm. And so uh, a number of times a year, I have my my blood tested for, let's say, liver damage or kidney damage. Could I be causing it? Because mm. I'm actually um, going over the top and doing, too, <laughs> doing okay. too many things, right? I'd have to say that I've never shown myself to have entered into, at least uh, from those tests, into the toxicity zone. I know that I have exceeded it on the exercise, because of I, I had a whole series of of uh, overuse uh, and overexercise uh, symptoms, so I had to cut back on what I was doing, and then then those symptoms actually went away, and and so so I think that that you know understanding that there is a inverted you that too little isn't isn't right, too much can be harmful. You have to find you know that what they call that the Goldilocks zone or the this uh, this optimal zone, and and um, uh, and and this is this is what what public health and this is what you know medicine really has to strive for, and and even there are so many other applications you know that that could we haven't even talked about these. For example, many people have surgeries and so forth that can be planned, and different investigators have shown that you can even do you know preconditioning to mm. to uh, stress yourself before a, a major stress event to uh, protect yourself against. Uh, um, all the stress you'll have from a surgical endeavor or it it could be, you know, something else. I mean, even when you are going through major uh, radiation treatments, I mean, you could, you could pre-treat yourself prior to the radiation actually, and you could reduce uh, 
um, the degree of, uh, let's say, mutational or rather damage that the high dose of radiation are causing to your body. Mm. You, yeah. there, there are a lot of things that people could do that they, they don't even, um, the system doesn't even think about, doesn't allow you to think about, doesn't even, it's not on their radar screen. But, but to the thinking person who knows this, you can, uh, uh, you can, you can, you can make a difference for yourself. But you'd like to have a difference made for all society, so okay. that these these things are built in, um, you know, built in, um, uh, and, and and make the system work better, so mm. that people could come out of it more healthy than they went into it. You know that that yeah. sort. Of thing. Yeah, like the, I think one one form of this preconditioning hormesis that i guess the mainstream medicine might use or i've heard that they have used is the use of like some form of uh, innovative fasting or fa fasting mimicking diet together with chemotherapy that uh, that supposedly reduces like the negative side effects from uh, chemotherapy and uh it's another form of this you know preconditioning your body before a larger stressor uh, which then makes the larger stressor smaller or have less of a negative effect. Uh, yeah, that would system. be an example. That's that that's that that that's a you know a, a current one that's em emerging in the last you know yeah. few years. You know that that sort of thing. And 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 there's all sorts of uh, um, examples of of uh, preconditioning prior to stress. You know that that sort of thing. Mm. And um, but also there there's there were such things as post conditioning that's this is we talk about doing something in advance but but actually you can be if it's, if you were exposed to let's say you had a a stroke or you had an act a brain traumatic damage or something like that there there are there are people uh, there, there's definitely good research that shows that if you intervene within a certain period of time after the damage i mean right after the damage uh, it's a limited window, but 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 you can enter enter into with a, a hormetic stress that will open, call it a post conditioning treatment that um, can well, act by a different mechanism than than the preconditioning, but you can get the same degree of protection, and and I've seen that in uh, on the brain, on on the heart, and so forth. Uh, it's it's uh, as biologically real as preconditioning, and and as effective, um, and that that sort of thing. It these are these are all part of uh, you know I don't know what's going to happen like a hundred years from now two hundred years from now but there, there's going to be you know just a a wealth of uh, new possibilities for for future generations I mean we're we're in many ways a um, pioneers with an idea mm. and and pointing the way uh, we really are pointing the way kind of like the Wright brothers with a with an airplane you know that sort of thing and to see to see space travel today. So we're kind of the Wright brothers when it comes to biological adaptations. A uh, hundred years from now, 200 years from now, I mean, I, I I tell you, I think that things could be, it, it would just be amazing to see how people build upon and take this and from this, these concepts and then apply it. I mean, mm. I mean right. it's, it, it's very, very, uh, uh, the, the potential is uh, interesting. I, I don't know what new technology will do to the 30 to 60 percent zone because we're really constrained within a biological context here. Whether whether uh, CRISPR technology and, and other things will will come in to try to modify these and so forth. I, I but this, you know, with something that's so, so general uh, built into every single organism, I'm, I'm a little bit fearful that if you if you found a way to increase the hormetic maxima to like threefold or fourfold, you know what what that might be that might be harmful to the overall survival interest of of the organism or cell. I mean, these are biological questions, you know, that that people will ultimately be testing in the laboratory. Mm. I mean, I mean, I, this is like way down the road, but maybe not that far down the road. You know where where yeah. people say, well, I mean, you get thirty to sixty percent. I can I can I can break those restrictions and get you to, I mean, for example, like an Alzheimer's patient. You know, you may be able to take a, an Alzheimer's patient who can't um, find his way to the bathroom or put on his shoes. Then you might give a treatment so now he can find his way to the bathroom and put on his shoes. You might say, well, okay, that's a twenty percent improvement. Maybe I can do. Get them up to you know a hundred percent. You know I can I can keep improving on this, 
with these uh, with new approaches and so forth. I, 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 right. I, I, this is, you know, the thing how things will be will be in fifty years, hundred years, be very, very interesting. And, and human creativity is is uh, pretty impressive. So I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful on, um, you know, that, that that things will be refined much more. Uh, and as I said, I think that we're the right brothers when it comes to uh, this public health uh, revolution that we're talking about mm. today. Because it really is a revolution in thinking. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. And um, we can maybe mention like, okay, so we know the basic idea of hormesis. We know that it's like these positive stressors. So like you can give maybe some examples that people can utilize in their everyday life to engage in some hormesis that, you know, of course, exercise and uh, some form of dietary restriction that we mentioned already. So like what are, you, you can also like mention like what you do in terms of your daily routine to, you know, find this uh, like low dose <laughs> stimulation. <laughs> It's it's interesting. I'd have to give the audience kind of a, a curious thing. I I remember this is probably 50, 20 years ago. I was giving a talk up in Canada uh, on a radio station and it was on hormesis. And the person said, "Well, since you spend your whole life doing hormesis, took the question that you just asked. What do you do, uh, you know, to enhance you know your life, you know, lifestyle and everything else?" And I says, "Oh gosh," I said, "I'm I'm Mister. I mean, I'm." Although I'm like Mr. Hormesis in my work, in my life, I'm like anti-hormesis. I, I said, I, when I work out, I work out too much and too hard. Mm -hmm. When I work in my job, I never stop working. I said, I'm, I, my hormesis is like this low dose thing. And my life is, is like way over the top dosing. Mm -hmm. And so I, and so I, I said, gosh, I said, I've, I'm I'm getting a lot of you know scientific papers published on hormesis, but it isn't helping my personal life. I said so. So how how can I change this? And so I would have to say, in the last ten years or so, uh, or a bit more than that, I I developed a um, uh, intermittent fasting um, lifestyle, which I've which I um, without getting into all the details, which I've morphed and changed over time, and and now I. I, I eat one meal a day. I go 23 hours without eating, and then I and I, and I eat, and uh, and so I have a, a and at the same time about four hours before I eat, I will um, I will exercise pretty vigorously, and so I'll, this afternoon, uh, mid afternoon, I will go and I'll I'll do about an hour, 15 or so minutes intense on a bicycle. I'll burn probably 800 calories, 900 calories. You know that that sort of thing, and so there's a um, fairly substantial. Uh, you know, for me, that's that's what I do, and mm. and 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 I'd have to say that uh, um, what I do is I I, I take uh, so I, exercise for me is the best medicine. Okay, I'd have to say that exercise I like it because it affects everything. Uh, I think from yeah. head to toe, it, to me, it's like the best medicine, and at the same time. Um, what I what I do is I I take uh, a wide range of supplements um, that I that I um, I find it actually I find eating one meal a day a challenge for me. I always used to have like a lot of times two meals a day. And I, I mean I had it built into an intermittent fasting, and I'm, I was always that you know have five vegetables or five fruits or you know there was a certain you know I love to have fruits and vegetables and 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 eat a lot of them. And I find that when I eat one meal a day. Man, I, I I don't want to feel bloated in my stomach. I want to feel comfortable in my stomach, and I so I I really can't have like five fruits and all these vegetables and and whatever because my I'm not that big to begin with, and my stomach can't be that large isn't that large to begin with, and and I said, oh well, well, how do I maintain this healthy lifestyle with just this this one meal a day, and I don't want to feel uncomfortable, and so I I said, well, you know, so there are different ways to do this. Uh, but but also um, I, I I actually um, ingest probably about forty or fifty supplements a day. I do mm. a mixture between morning and afternoon. I eat each. I have to say each of these supplements before I take them in, before I ingest them. I actually do a lot of uh, literature search on each one, um, 
and to try to find out, you know, um, a lot of biology, the tissue distribution, um, where it goes and you know, how much is crossing my, the blood brain barrier, where they all end up going, what their, their half-life is in the body and what their effects are. And I, and I actually try to mix and match agents that, that, I, that I want to take with some agents will not pass the blood brain barrier, some will. Now, some agents go to certain organs and others go to other organs. And I try to actually, I have a matrix and I try to put those together. And I mm. try to say, well, what actually will seem to work for me? And, 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 uh, and so I, I actually go, go through this. And, and, I, and so I balanced it off between giving half lives and everything. Um, you know, what I take in the morning and night, what I take twice a day, and, and however I do that. This, I mean, this is, and then I, I'd say many of the things that I take, I have now published papers on. And so when I really go into these in great detail, these get obviously translated into, into, into scientific papers that other people can read. And in all these papers, I would have to tell the audience, the scientific community is, is, um, it's, it's never, the science is never, is never satisfactory. There's, mm. It's intriguing. It's encouraging. You see lots of good effects. You see this and you see a lot of things. And in the end, there's, there's insufficient data on almost everything to make a, a legitimate, you know, public health decision on this agent versus the another to the next to the next. And yet, okay. and, and you can't wait for the U.S. or other <laughs> Food and Drug Administration to tell you what to do because they're never going to tell you what to do. So you see all these right. studies that are highly suggestive and they could be good. And you say, oh, should I take this or not take this? Who am I going to listen to? And I say to myself, Ed, I said, you know enough to to understand these things. Right. You're going to have to decide what you're going to take or not and then make this decision and 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 so forth. And so and, and yet there's a lot of uncertainty in in this because you're always trying to stay on top of this. I tell you, a number of years ago, I sent what my listing of uh, of uh, of supplements that I take. I sent them to about twenty leading uh, neuroscientists across the world, and I said, "This is what I take to preserve my my neurons and whatever else part of my body." And I said, "Tell me what you do," uh, and um, and because we've we've never really published papers on on what we uh, what we take. We always you know do the traditional scientific papers. Every one of these neuroscientists wrote me back with what they take to preserve their neurons. It was very interesting. And I'd have to tell you that that would be a very interesting uh, paper to publish. I can tell you mm. that. And, and, and I, but I'd have to tell you that each of these very high level people, they were all very different from each other. This was mm. like their own personal decision. This yeah. one did X and someone did Y and someone did something else. And, and then I looked at them and I said, well, who's the craziest one of, of the 20? And I said, well, look in the mirror and see who the craziest one of it is. It's you. I said, <laughs> I'm much more aggressive than all of them were. You know, they were all doing something. And they're all a little and I could learn from each. You know, we all could learn from each other. Uh, you know, that's and, and, you, and I asked why they were doing certain things and so forth. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, un, there's there's a lot that, that needs to be uh, discussed on this and and try to because I mean, I'd be happy someday to to talk with you in the audience about uh, really go over what I take mm. and why I take it. Uh, right. And, you know, because that's that's getting down to where the rubber meets the road. You know, what, what, you know, what do you actually do and why do you actually do it? And what's the justification for or, you know, why you're taking this? And and I'd have to say my wife and my two educated sons, they look at me and they say, Dad, that's it. You're an N of one. <laughs> and so we'll see what happens to you before we follow your lifestyle. Right. And so even even in my my own little environment of my own, you might say, family, um, none of them listen to me. Mm. Uh, you know, I, the only one who listens to me is me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I say to myself, you know, I know a lot more than they think I know. Cause I, I start, I work 80 hours a week on this stuff and I've been doing that for decades. I know a lot. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think I do. And, uh, but not enough to convince the people that I, I've lived with <laughs> to follow what I do. But, 
But yeah, and I said, well, they said, well, how does this make you feel? You take all these, I said, I said, I don't feel any, I wouldn't feel any different if I stopped it. I said, what I'm really trying to do is I said, I'm trying to slow down protein oxidation. I'm trying to, you know, these are subtle things that, 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 that ultimately cripple your cells. I'm trying to upregulate, you know, processes that process all these damaged uh, organelles and mitochondria and, and re recycle them or get rid of them or however this is going to go on. I said, these are things, it's not like you wake up and say, oh, wow, I'm loaded with energy. I have, no, I said, mm -hmm. uh, this is, I said, this is a, the long game. And I said, it's all molecular oxidation. And you're trying to find ways to uh, uh, to optimize, you know, what what should go on in a cell and how to optimize the, the clearing out of damaged protein and things of that nature. Don't expect to uh, to uh, take a pill one day and say, "Oh, wow!" Because I, I see these advertisements on television. I take this and I oh, I can walk up the stairs today. And I said, "I don't think that's how it works. That's <laughs> not how it works for me." I said, "This is a much deeper biological question." It really mm. deals with, uh, you know, it, it deals with how how cells deals deals with uh, damage and how it recycles uh, damaged protein and and how you you don't come up the metabolic works in your cells and the next thing you know, um, you know, you have a, a more prolonged lifespan that is um, um, better functioning than mm. people that don't follow that. Right, but how do you know if it's too much? Or how do you know if you've exceeded the optimal zone of the hormesis? Well, uh, the only uh, that that's a great question. The only way that, that I have done it is that I mean, one is subjective. You have to understand yourself and how you. And, and I did that with the with the exercise, or I had to tone it back. The other is is that I I I do go and I and I and I. It's not it's not great, uh, but I but I have. Uh, you know, I go in a number of times a year and I have my, I, I have certain, you know, blood and urine taken and I have it looked at for certain types of uh, changes. And, mm -hmm. and, and so that's telling me if I've gone too far for the most part. And, right. and, and so, but, but most people, uh, I can't imagine almost anybody doing that. Mm. Uh, and, and 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 the physicians that you go and talk to they they don't they don't have a clue of what 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 you're talking about either <laughs> if you know what i mean you they, they're very good for a lot of different things but but you know I, I find that this is you have to if you have a physician who understands you and you can educate the physician to then work with you to uh, to help you uh uh monitor what you want monitored um then then that's See, yeah, you have to have a cooperating, uh, you know, medical uh, group that you interact with, and and they yeah. see this as, and I don't mind paying for extra tests or this and that and so forth, you know, because it's 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 in my best interest to do that. But mm. yeah, this, but but this, it's it's this is not an easy thing to do, uh, because right. the, the, you know the studies are imperfect. You have to make judgments. See, in your life, you say, okay, I'm 77 years old, right? And and let's say I, I want to take a new supplement. Well, I mean, how many years do I have left? How's it going to make me feel? Um, and and uh, how do I know that it's going to work? And 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 I'd have to say I if all I do is study, and so I, I study these things, and so I have some sort of a sense. One thing I don't you know have, you know, this is interesting. That they uh, take a lot of different substances. Some of them have act on similar same mechanisms. But but I can tell you, if I take when you take a look at a very specific chemical tested showing hormesis, then you can take a mixture of chemicals showing hormesis. Mixtures mixtures uh, still conform to the same quantitative constraints of hormesis. You might take six hormetic agents, each that show uh, thirty to sixty percent optimal you mix them all together you are not going to get anything additive beyond the 30 to 60 percent this is what we've we've shown in our work uh, and and it's so interesting when you when you take a look at extracts from plants versus specific chemicals you don't get any difference in in the optimal response uh, mm. from mixture to to an individual chemical it's really very very you know very very interesting why is that the case and and um and so i 
uh, th th these are, you know, uh, these are, are things that we have to work out and, and work with at the present time. I, it's, but, uh, but my, my fear of all this is that, is that we're so far ahead of the uh, governments. We're so far ahead of the, the medical community. I mean, we are pushing the envelope of, um, of applications. Mm. And, and, and I, I think that's quite real. Mm. Yeah. What about these, let's say, evolutionarily novel and, uh, let's say, unnatural kinds of uh, stressors like different chemicals uh, in our environment and microplastics and uh, those kind of things? Like, do those also have any hormetic uh, benefit? Well, I'll have to say that... Um... We're published on on microplastics, and they they actually and a lot, a lot of people have actually, and they they do show hormetic effects. If you if you stress a system, if you stress a system, the system responds to that stress by a compensatory process. Mm. And and this was actually my my original work with the plants and this growth inhibitor. If if you really looked at the plant growth over time, you initially cause some some limited toxicity, and then what happens is that the plant you now see responds by not only repairing the damage, but then it overcompensates uh, modestly, no more than the thirty to sixty percent. And it's and it's interesting too on like the ionizing radiation, which you know is a mutagen and, and this sort of thing. But ionizing radiation from X rays, things of that nature, uh, it when it hits cells, it's uh, it, it can cause damage, but it also causes. Uh, Water to be hydrolyzed, it'll form reactive oxygen species. It creates creates an interesting cellular milieu. But what it does is it ultimately uh, it, it stimulates the cell to uh, generate a whole amata of of antioxidant uh, um, agents. And and in fact, um, what many people have shown, and that is, is that l low doses of uh, Relatively low doses of, of X-rays, when uh, you know, can be used effectively to treat areas of inflammation, um, mm. to treat arthritis, to treat uh, all kinds of circumstances. I've seen this in animal studies where they I saw a study out of Germany. It had about six or seven different um, different arthritic models um, of genetic or, or dietary or other other uh, other factors are chemically induced and so forth. And and they treated them all with uh, a wide range dose of of X rays, and these these mice had very swollen paws. I mean, it could, very sore, very swollen. When they treated them with with uh, X rays, this is so strange. They at the optimal dose of the X ray, it it just turned on these antioxidant uh, responses, and the swelling in the paws of these mice just went right down to what it would be in the control group. And then at higher doses, it actually caused, uh, you know, more um, oxidant stress, that sort of thing. And so you you have uh, uh, nature is very interesting, and nature, you know, our our bodies are are amazing in how they have evolved to uh, uh, to cope with all sorts of stress um, within a within a limited within a limited range, and, and even even the uh, you know exposure to to Highly toxic agents, things like methyl mercury or cadmium or lead or beyond the radiation, you find that they all induce these adaptive mechanisms. That mm. the, and the body is trying to uh, to protect against them. And right. um, I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate taking any of these things, but but I uh, and they're all toxins right. in their own right. But 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 uh, nonetheless, the body is is showing its capacity to uh, to protect itself. That's that's what it's really doing. And, you know, evolution and the study of evolution has taught me that that humans are and on all life that we see on Earth, they are survivors. We are survivors of a long process. And and we're we're the you might say the current victors, so to speak. Current and and, and what that means is that is that we've we've been through a lot of you know fights over the millennia, developed a, a capacity to protect ourselves. And our capacity to resist damage is very robust, and we're not we're not sissies or we're not weak. 
uh, as a species. We're very strong as a species. We have all these capacities to protect ourselves. And, uh, and, and, and those are, and what we're trying to do in this discussion today is, is talk about ways in which we can make sure that, that we can uh, keep them robust to help us uh, live uh, a more healthy um, lifespan and, 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 and a longer life that within the constraints of, uh, of what evolution's imposed on us, which is, I believe, this 30 to 60 percent uh, constraint. Um, mm. You know that that sort of thing, and uh, and and so people are afraid of stresses, but they should not be afraid of stress and reasonable stress, uh, mm. because that will actually um, activate uh, adaptive mechanisms that will make us even more robust. Mm. And that yeah. that's that's how I look at it. And that mm. is everything I do in life is to stress myself. Mm-hmm. Everything I do in life is to stress myself. And um, in moderation. And, well, yeah, yeah, and that's right. That's right. And it's, it's, uh, and, and that's from, I didn't meant, you meant, ask me other questions. I mean, uh, as a result of literature, I started to do, you know, cold showers and you know, this sort of thing. I do everything uh, to, and not that it's terribly, uh, you know, comforting to take a cold shower at the cold, you know, three to five minute cold shower every day at the coldest uh, amount of water that, that comes out of the faucet. But I do that. And, and so, I mean, there. Are, but that this is another example of I know that'll in, induce cold shock proteins and things of this nature, and well, you know, and uh, and I don't know what they're ultimately doing for me, um, but um, but I everything I do is is predicated around um, a stress, a low level stress that I think will will be um, will will have a, a net benefit, mm. a net a net benefit, and so right. it's. But yet, you know, the, uh, uh, that's why we're really, as I said, we're so early in this game. Of, I mean, we know a lot. We know an awful lot. But we're still early in, in the application game for humanity. And, and that's why I think that, you, you know, 100 years down the road, 200 years down the road, I can't imagine this, what people will see or do with, with, what, with what we know today. Mm. And, yeah. You know, Amazing. With with regard to like the mercury and these other like p- plastics and stuff, I guess the dose or the homeopathic dose is probably like pretty small. <laughs> so like, you know, the amount of cadmium or some other heavy metal that would uh, not cause a negative response is probably like super small compared to some other like more natural stressor like, you know, vegetables or coffee or something like that. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I have to say that uh, uh, each depends on on the organ, you know, on, a, on the agent in the organism. But um, on the pollution side, I mean, I'm, I'm I would you know I would be cautious and say, you know, I I want doses as low as possible, you know, because right. I I'd, I'd prefer to take my stress from uh, from dietary supplements, exercise, and and other lifestyle adjustments. I there there, there is a possibility that you know that. Uh, Toxic substances, you know, could have a beneficial effect. That's, I'm, I'm, I know that they do. I've seen enough studies right. to know that they do. That that's 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 not how people should be getting their hormetic dose responses. <laughs> people yeah. should be getting their hormetic dose responses to uh, via via things that are. I mean, but everything we do is toxic. I mean, even mm. these these uh, uh, supplements and, and and other things, exercise, everything we do, if it goes beyond the dose, is 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 uh, is toxic but i would have to say that you know there are some things the agents that that, that are just inherently more toxic and that and and, uh, and and you know some of these a lot of the supplements i take they don't really have nutritional value they they just have you know um uh, a value that they uh, they upregulate various uh, mm. um, pathways and within yeah. within the body but they're not they're not for you know nutritional functioning yeah, you're not taking vitamins or <laughs> yeah, well, you know that that's that sort of thing, right? And mm. so you went, so it's but nonetheless, I, I think that the uh, um, uh, regulatory groups and so forth they 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 should really speak about you know how do we optimize um, a healthy lifespan? How do we optimize uh, you know uh, lo- longevity approaches? What's 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 the strategy for optimization here 
and, mm. and it really is it really is uh, uh, stressing people, Stre- stressing them psychologically. <laughs> I mean, stressing. I, I don't mean you know like putting them through you know marine boot camp. I mean that's mm-hmm. got to be too too much. But but you don't you you want to make you, you want to have a uh, healthy stress. You want to have uh, you know you want you want your your children to be stressed. You don't want them to be coddled. You want mm. them to, to, you know, within within reason, w- within that optimal zone, you want them to be st- stressed in all different sorts of ways. You want yourself to be stressed in those different ways. And, yeah. and that will optimize your response. You don't want too little. You don't want too much. It takes a lot of wisdom to figure out what, what is. And, and that's also when you when you have graduate students in school, you, you're, you're stressing them. You're definitely stressing them. Mm. And you have to figure out, you don't want them to have a nervous breakdown. You don't want yourself to have a nervous breakdown. You you want, but you want you want people to be to be um, um, challenged. You might call it stressed, uh, yeah. but you don't want it to be. You know, to you don't want it to be too little. You don't want it to be too much. You want to, and 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 that takes on the, on the human interaction side. That takes a lot of wisdom. Um, yeah. To to know, and then that's what coaches do. I mean, that's what coaches do. They are stressing their 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 swimmers or their runners or their 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 players, uh, but you 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 have to understand the, the the psychology of a coach is really to optimize performance, and it, yeah. and, the, and you're optimizing performance within that hormetic zone. So, and, and this is not and really much different than than or not any different really than than you know. What's the optimal length for a cold shower? What's the optimal length for a sauna? Sauna, how hot, how this and how that. It's all it all has its quantitative parameters, all centered around uh framing a hormetic dose response. Yeah, it's like the hormesis has, you know, health benefits to you, but um like the resilience is also like a virtue <laughs> in terms of let's say your role as a human being, or not another role, but you know, as a part of a society like if you're more resilient both physically and mentally then you're like you know more reliable as a member of the society and you're more like functional as well in many ways so like yeah i think many people would need to be or the, you know a lot of the modern society makes us less resilient or makes us more fragile in many ways you know first of all m- most people don't exercise and they don't do anything physical but also mentally, like there's this, I guess, yeah, like everything is kind of uh, like safe and everything is very predictable in some ways. And you don't lack this mental, let's say, challenge that much um, or like you're not required to have like a lot of mental resilience, <laughs> if that makes sense. No, it fits right into the same framework that we're talking. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's, a, it, it, it's a it's an all encompassing concept because it. It, it it's socio it's from psychology sociology all the way down to to the individual cell and it's all yeah. coping with uh with uh you know with with uh with stress actually and try to optimize your response to your environment I mean, yeah. this, is, this is it's really very interesting how how it all works but yes well, it's been great uh, talking with you. We could yeah, definitely do many hours more of all the details and all the different types of stress. But um, yeah, before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work? Uh, well, uh, if you're a scientist, um, you can certainly find me <laughs> in, in uh, PubMed and Web of Science because I've published uh, a lot and published uh, you know, there. But I'm at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, anybody who wanted to to email me, um, you can post my email. It's edwardc at umass.edu. I, I answer emails quickly. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to people on the phone. Um, and you can post my, my telephone number as well. And, and, and I think that that's... Uh, um, um, and I'd be, I'm open to, uh, to talk to people on, on Zooms. It's fun to talk and see who you're talking with. And if you're interested in what we have and we have a professional interest, uh, that would be great. So I'm, I'm, uh, I like to communicate with people. <laughs> Sounds good. And my last question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you had up sooner? 
Um, one piece of advice that I would offer? No, that you uh, wish you adopted sooner. Oh, one thing that I would offer. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. Well, I would have to say that... Um, I would I would have to say that I would it, it would tie, be tied into to intermittent fasting. Mm. Wish that I had done that uh, much earlier. Um, exercise I've done from a, a young age. So I've ever since I was you know five years old I I haven't stopped moving since you know exercising since. So I I think it'd be more more uh, more on a dietary basis than. Uh, than anything else. Um, so I leave it that way. Gotcha. That's yeah. good. <laughs> I've been also doing a lot of, or I've been doing intermittent fasting since I was like 18 or something. So over 10 years. <laughs> well, then uh, that's the way you've got a, a good start on it. Wonderful <laughs> start on it. Thank yeah. you so much for, uh, for having me on this and I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to your future uh, studies and papers. Thank you very much. And there's uh, always something new coming out, published quite a bit every year. But do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.